I want to let everybody know that uh, this will be recorded webinar so that we could put it up in the GRSS YouTube channel at some point. Um, with me today, uh, we have Sujit and others who will be uh, doing the presentation, but I also have Jerika Krishman, who is going to be helping us monitor the chat. She is the executive secretary for the Earth Science Technical uh, Informatics Technical Committee. Um, I think we will have the questions at the end. Um, unless you have any burning questions, you can chat us and then we can interrupt uh, Sujit. But uh, otherwise, we'll wait for the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, can you go to the next slide? All right, just a little bit of background. Um, the Geosciences and Remote Sensing Society is a community of researchers and, and practitioners who are working on many uh, societal and grand, grand challenges related to earth and environment. And uh, it has established several technical committees that actively promote uh, to discuss these issues and advances in areas of uh, technology that could be helpful in addressing some of the challenges. So this particular webinar is brought to you by the Earth Science Informatics Technical Community, or in short, uh, ESITC, which has uh, long been a platform for discussions on advancing applications of informatics and data science for, for focused on geosciences. So one of the things that uh, we do is look at the technology horizon uh, and see whether that may have implications to earth science research and applications. So as part of that, uh, we remain very proactive and bring um, experts together to discuss opportunities and challenges. And one such technology is the foundation model. Uh, Sujit, who is today's main speaker, uh, approached us uh, a couple of months ago, um, exploring whether we can form a new working group under the ESITC. And this webinar is part of that new working group's effort to build a community around foundation models for geosciences. So with that, let me hand it over to Sujit. Thank you, Manil. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. So today in this webinar, we are going to talk about uh, the working group that we have proposed and we are bringing it. Uh, additionally, we will go with the uh, motivation behind having this talk and I'll go over the two foundation models that we have recently designed. And that is one is Prithvi related to the Landsat or you can say uh, satellite imagery. And the second one is the weather FM, where we are dealing with the uh, variables of the MERA2 or reanalysis data set like ERA5 and MERA2. So this is the new working group that we have been proposing, and that is uh, AI foundation model and digital twins for geoscience. So we are uh, leading this uh, effort in order to bring out the community in order to understand and uh, collaborate together to create foundation models or utilize this foundation model for multiple downstream use cases where we can represent components of digital twin to be in function. Additionally, the, I, uh, we, I'll be uh, you know, leading this group along with my uh, two co three colleagues actually here. One is Dr. Rajat Shinde. He works at NASA Impact and he has a huge background of uh, ex experience in uh, remote sensing and machine learning along with Johannes Schmud, and he is a colleague, along with he works at the IBM Research, he's a research scientist, and uh, he has been working on uh, with us on the weather FM uh, designing side. Dalton Lunga, he is with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and he has an IDF representation where he will be looking at fundamentally more on the architecture side or like scalability of these things. So motivation behind these working groups is that we want to develop a GeoFM, which is uh, which will require cross disciplinary collaboration among geoscientists, experts in foundational AI, data engineers, and machine learning engineers, right? Because to make it operational in all sense, we need to get it into the ML ops. Now, important is that once we take the Found, we design the foundation model. There is a component of fine tuning, right? So until as you fine tune or uh, the model for a specific downstream use cases, there will be not a lot of impact or you know, usability for these foundation models. So trying to bring them together the community as well, where people can use these open source models and create multiple uh, downstream use cases which they can lead out, right? 
So we are also looking at current gap within the techni existing uh, technical committees and trying to see that what are the technical challenges that we can address here in order to see uh, technical challenges which we can address and then take that forward from the AI side for specifically looking at geoscience. The goals that we will have is we will convene uh, with the experts in AI. For example, Johannes Schmidt is one of them. I'm one of them. We have other collaborations related to uh, University of Manchester that we can talk to a couple of people and also in India. So there are a lot of uh, experts in AI who will be interested uh, to perform a geoscience for collaborative research. We would also try to accelerate innovation and supporting open science principle, maximizing the utility of science data for various applications, and training community on the best practices to build and use the GOFM. This is the overall structure of the uh, foundation model for geoscience that we have been proposing. One is data-centric AI, so uh, which will be led by Dr. Rajesh Shinde, and there will be a development of data-centric AI models for our system and ecosystem, which is a very important part because uh, with the proper design of the data and which data is going to contribute in designing the foundation models, it becomes, uh, and how this data will be made open source so that people can also use it for reproducibility or even understanding the, uh, you know, understanding the coherence behind why these data were selected in this fashion and then how we can, uh, you know, take this forward further. So promoting also the data-centric AI for digital twin and also the outreach activities for data-centric AI. For architecture modulations, uh, I, Dr. Johannes Schmoot is going to assist me in terms of uh, using of pre-trained and fine-tuned large multi-models. We are look, looking at uh, your Prithvi, which is GeoFM, in terms of uh, looking at the satellite data, then you have the weather FM. We also try to externalize the GeoI framework development and facilitating the knowledge sharing. For infrastructure, we have Dalton Lunga, and that is for infrastructure for GeoFM and uh, optimizations. We'll also try to cover the training on all aspects of building and using geo foundation models, and also what are the ethical and the responsible practices for the geo foundation models. So these are a couple of planned events that we will be having this year. Is somewhere around summer school or winter school, and this year we'll be conducting workshops. Uh, also, we will have another web webinar on data centric AI, and probably we will have a potential joint event with IDF and React Technica. Uh, technical challenge in order to have a trillion pixel. So 20, 2024 trillion pixel challenge focused on foundation models. You can join this uh, ESI technical co committee by you know, scanning the QR or just click on the link. So now we will delve into the foundation models. So for the first part one, I'm going to cover the satellite based foundation model that we have created. And the other part will go with the weather FM. Once the first part is over, we'll take questions related to the GFM and then we'll go over uh, to the uh, weather FM side. So we are looking at, uh, in terms of introduction, so they are like foundation models are uh, a type of generative AI. So they produce outputs from inputs or prompts. So inputs are typically in form of human language instructions, right? So what foundation models can do, it can be done adaptive learning, diverse applications, language and translation capabilities, visual and coding skills, human interaction, speech processing, and also classification and other stuff. You can look at the list of foundation models. I tried to put a couple of them. They are heavily dominant in the language domain, and we have not seen a lot of foundation models in the domain of vision specifically, and especially due to satellite and other reanalysis data sets, which are minimal. So you're looking at CLIP, GPT, Claude, and then you have the DALI and stable diffusion for the vision uh, based on diffusion models. Then you have the Prithvi, uh, which is a satellite imagery, weather FM, which is on the reanalysis data of the weather variables. So use of AI foundation model for science. So we uh, this is generally the approach. So we have the, we select the data or the data sets that we want to go ahead with. We pre-train. So pre-training is done using self-supervised learning. So we lower down the efforts in order to provide the labeling of the data or doing the super, you know, performing the supervised modeling. So you don't need to do a labeling and other scenario. Once you train this model, which can be done by masking approaches and asking the model to generate those masks, we can divert it across to multiple applications. So you can use the same foundation models. You can use the same pre-trained weights and fine tune those weights to cater multiple uh, variety of use cases. So this is the first foundation model that we uh, created, which is the Prithvi foundation model for generalist geospatial artificial intelligence. We have also released the paper on, uh, on archive. And there are a couple of uh, fine tuning tooling and you know, GitHub resources are available, available 
over uh, the uh, for the summer school also that we conducted last year and fine tuning tooling available with GitHub. These are the couple of models that we made available, which is 100 million parameter model, uh, which is open source on Hugging Face. Then the fine tuned burn scar uh, model uh, also available on Hugging Face. Similarly, flood detection fine tuned model available on Hugging Face and also the multi temporal cross classification. So when you look at the variety, it is mostly you have the segmentation and then also you're looking at the multi temporal cross, uh, you know, crop classification. So for designing Prithvi, we utilized HLS. So harmonized Landsat data, it provides consistent global observation of the land. It is designed by combining the Sentinel uh, and the Landsat. So the data available in tiles aligned with the military, uh, you know, MGRS uh, tile referencing system. It has a 30 meter resolution and each tile has 3,660 cross 3,660 pixels, which is approximately 110, 210 kilometer. And we have one GeoTIFF for spectral bands. So when we designed this uh, foundation model for the Prithvi for selecting data, we just selected six bands, which was RGB, NIR, uh, SWIR1 and SWIR2. The data sampling procedure was we selected a pre-trained data and what the idea was that we want to get the diverse, diversified pre-training data set. So for a given region, image can look across, you know, image can be very similar across time. So if you do the random sampling and also other stuff, you will have more chances of getting the data which are common across the landscape. So the model will be biased towards the landscape. So what we get ahead with is we aggregate various geospatial statistics in the left-hand side of the image, if you look at it, we are looking at temperature and precipitation, which have been calculated over 20 years. And we try to uh, cluster the tiles based on that. And we divide the region into group based on these statistics and then sample HLS tiles as equally as possible from each group. So this model was done on US CONUS regions. So it was completely done over the uh, US region only. So this is uh, one of the fine tuning uh, task that we were looking at in terms of, uh, you know, which was flood mapping. But when we look at the full of the design of the, uh, of, the of, of this uh, foundation model, you have HLS data, which we talked about. You have six bands here, which is red band, green band, blue band, and IR. And then you have SWIR1 and SWIR2. So what you do is you take this HLS data, you mask them. So you perform a random masking of approximately 70% of the data. Then what you do is you flatten it and you give it to the encoder. The object, the idea for the decoder is to do a temporal MAE pre-training. So in this case, we used mask auto encoder. So the idea is that we'll ask the model, hey, can, given these 40% or 30% of samples, can you generate me the next 60% and 70% of the data? And then we try to minimize the loss onto that. So in this process, the encoder learns the relationship between uh, each of the pixels and the tiles and also also in the temporal domain. So we were taking three input time steps here. So it's not just 2D image, it was 3D. So you're taking three input time steps, which are consecutive three days uh, in HLS. So you're talk talking about a relationship that you're looking at a divided space-time attention. And the decoder is going to do that. And then you combine an L L1 loss with the reconstructed image corresponding to the original image, right? So you can use segmented heads to fine tune and evaluate the foundation model. So this part that you look here is actually the pre-training part. So you are doing the pre-training here and trying to validate based on that. Now, once the pre-training is done, you detach the decoder. You just take the encoder. You have the pre-trained weights, let's say it is theta. And you take that and you try to fine tune that weights of theta over the encoder using a segmentation head. And that is nothing but a you know, pixel-wise classification, right? So you can provide an original image and you do a, uh, segmentation, a uh, simple uh, training that we have seen in machine learning models. We try to minimize the loss by looking at the difference between both of the, you know, constructed uh, mask with the original mask. And then we try to minimize over that. And that's the output that we uh, converge towards, right? So the then we also try to compare with the state of the art related, let's say unit architecture or some other architecture which have been published in the domain. Or if not, then we choose the existing methodology and we try to do that. So the idea is that we have one trained geospatial foundation model and it can be used for multiple downstream tasks. For example, let's say that this was Prithvi. So we can use this for binary segment, semantic segmentation, which is let's say uh, you have detecting burn scar, floods, et cetera. Then you have multi-class uh, semantic segmentation. In the same image, you can have classifying crop species. So let's say that you have 10 crop species. You want to do the classification, you will use this. 
And similarly, for the same model, you again fine tune it and you can use for data imputation. Let's say that there was a cloud gap filling. So there was a cloud over the images. So you have the initial condition set with the T0 and T1, uh, T2, and then you are asking it to fill the T2, uh, T1 from here. So it will do that. So it is a generation. So this is the first downstream that we did, uh, which was the Prithvi flood mapping. So we used the Sen1 flood 11 data set. The Sentinel-2, there was a 10 meter resolution and it contained a single time, a time step of Sentinel image for 11 flood events around the world. And uh, the labels contain manually annotated water extent. So we had total sample size of 446, where the 252 was the training sample size, validation was 91, test was 90, uh, 91. And it was in the size of 512 by 512 uh, chips, which we call it a email size. So you can call, call it as you know cropped images. So these are the flood mapping results that we are looking at. So for example, when you look at these images with the uh, spatial plus temporal domain, so you perform these things and then it will give you a pass it through the inference and you will get the uh, flood impact, right? So we try to compare with the baseline uh, along with the other pre-trained models. So we have, we have tested with the BIT, the SWIN, which is another transformers based approach and Prithvi, not pre-trained, pre-trained and also uh, Prithvi after 500 epochs. Where we see that Prithvi was able to get the IOU of 82.99 along with the MOU for the body classes for 90.16, which is more than the state of the art. And when we are training on just the same data, so these models were trained on exactly only the flood mapping data set, not the all of the data set. But here in the Prithvi, you are fine tuning on the flood one and not you know pre training on the flood data set. So if once we do the NWSN study, they're trying to see that hey, how it is useful, okay. So we try to do that. So we have Prithvi, which is pre-trained, and then Prithvi not pre-trained and Prithvi frozen encoder, right? So you try to look at this in terms of the number of iterations and IOE water class. So obviously when you have Prithvi is pre-trained, you have the maximum classification performance. Similarly, when you're trying to look at how much data I can reduce when I'm trying to do the fine tuning, and this is such a nice study because when we are trying to get these previous results that you saw, we are giving 100% data. So can I achieve the similar performance when I'm feeding less data to the model? Yes, I can. So in this study, when we try to do that, we tried to, we, we understood that, okay, we have this is original data that is performing, uh, you know, with 82% approximately. I reduced the data to 50%, 75%, and also we did the 87.5% reduction. We almost, with a lot of number of iteration, you reach the same point, but even in the initial steps, we are just training for, let's say, 15,000 iterations. We have overall not a huge loss in terms of performance, you know, comparison performance. So what does this help to is you'll be able to reduce a lot of number of samples in the data. So with this foundation, with the using of the foundation model, what you are reducing is the human effort on labeling these classes for all of the data and for all other downstream as well. This is just one foundation, you know, for flood mapping. You can have, you can use the same model for other downstream and you will not use so many labeled samples. So we did an external assessment. So we had, uh, there was an, this is by another paper that was done. And also they reported that uh, our Prithvi model has uh, 86.02 compared to the other model, which is a former and QNAP. So this is related to the another downstream, which is burn scar. And so the burn scar, we have again, the HLS data set, and it contained the single timestamp uh, HLS images with labels that were retrieved from the MTBS and paired with the next high quality HLS images. We had total samples of 805 images, 540 for training and 265 for validation. Same 512 by 512 chips. We provided the HLS data and the masks to the encoder. We have the convolution head. It's just going to do the dice loss on the ground truth versus the prediction. Why dice loss? Because if you look at this whole images, uh, you're looking at more of the background class than the actual class that is there. So this will help you in terms of, uh, you can also do the binary cross entropy and just provide a weighting on these classes that can be achieved by that as well. So in the Prithvi Bonskar results as well, when you go to the inference, you are looking at with the baseline unit VIT base and not pre-trained and pre-trained, you're looking at high, uh, you know, highest performance in Prithvi, which is 73.62 and F1 of 84.81. When you train a unit exactly on the same data uh, with all of that data, you are able to get 82.05. So we performed a similar ablation study in order to see that if we, our study is consistent with whatever we have seen before. In this case, since we are looking at a huge gap in the number of classes,
is and the background classes and stuff, we were able to see that when the pre pre-train was there, it still you have the highest performance. But in this case specifically, we are looking at, for example, if you, even if you do a reduction of let's say 50%, you're able to go that, but with a heavy reduction in data, your performance doesn't reach to the original performance, which makes sense because now when you're reducing this much amount of data, you're also reducing the amount of, uh, you know, examples the model can see and in that case even you are you are you are actually uh, forcing the model to learn uh, with the performance which is uh, where the background classes are comparatively much more higher in pixel compared to the foreground classes another thing that we looked at which is the cloud uh, sorry clouds gap filling data set and in this case it's a generative task so we had a sample size of 7852 the training and validation was there. So we tried to contain three input, input time steps for HLS images from one to 200 days apart. So image was screened to have no more than 5% of cloud coverage. And then we tried, uh, this study was conducted by Clark uh, University. And then we tried to do the generations. So when we tried to look at it compared to the CGAN, which is a uh, you know, cycle GAN uh, training error, and also the PRISVI training error, we are looking at PRISVI has uh, MAE of uh, approximately uh, 0. 035 and uh, your uh, sorry, Prithvi has the training error of something around 0 0.20 and validation of 0 0.25, where cycle GAN has somewhere around 0 0.35. And the number of training samples as you're feeding it uh, ahead, it is almost flattening out, but Prithvi has a higher margin in the comes of cycle GAN. Then we also tried to see, uh, since we are doing a generative task, it is important to look at the structural similarity index. So that's why we compare it against the SSIM. So, in, so SSIM means the higher the SSIM, more close it is. So best would be to have it one. So in that case, Prithvi training SSIM was higher than the cycle GAN uh, validation, you know, training SSIM as well as validation SSIM. So this was done after 200 epochs of training. So these are the outputs. So you provided one single input, uh, you have this, uh, you know, you provide this input space and then uh, you ask the model with to be constructed with the cloud gap filling one and the model produce these which are highly uh, sort of accurate in terms of what uh, whatever model is producing, right? In terms of cycle GAN and in terms of VAT. So this is another one. So, you know, this is just to visualize that what all was learned and uh, what model has to predict in order to learn that. So in all of these cases, where do you have the masking, uh, where do you have the clouds and the model generated the next consecutive time steps. So now coming to the nutshell of what if, I give you foundation model. So what, how does it help you like, okay, so that you're providing me with foundation model and uh, how does it help in, uh, in terms of uh, training, GPU, compute and other stuff. So let's say that pre-training was done. Then when you're using the burn scar, you are just using 35% of the total time compared to 65% when you're using a single machine learning model just for burn scar. Then you're using flood mapping. Similarly, 73% of the time you spent, uh, actually you will spend on a unit based architecture to train, you will be spending just 27% of that same time of uh, into the flood mapping for the uh, using the pre-trained Prithvi. Cloud filling, still you're looking at 66 to 34%, right? So in, a, in an average, if you look at it, you have, you're spending more time on having individual machine learning models, which are not transferable in nature as for the, uh, you know, for the transfer learning possibilities. But when you're taking a foundation model, you can actually use the pre-trained weights to transfer across the multiple cases, right? Similarly, uh, when we look at the performance comparison, so you are having a better performance as well with a lesser time. So it's a, it seems like a pretty good deal to me, isn't it? So you are having a lesser amount of time, but you are getting a better performance with all those, uh, you know, uh, with all the, compared to the existing state-of-the-art machine learning models. And the best part is the data samples used. Now, annotating data is a heavy task, and in this uh, specifically in geospatial domain, we have a lot of data which are not annotated. And so you'll have to ask somebody to annotate it. You prepare the data, and then you train these models. So, for example, burn scar, you needed 540 samples. All of the data was trained on 540 samples, but you achieve the same performance or better than that during just 135 samples of 512 by 512 chips. In flood mapping, same 252 was required for the base uh, for creating a baseline, which was we're looking at strain uh, VAT or UNET, and then we just achieved the same thing with something around 30 uh, samples. In cloud gap filling, you get an uh, achievable accuracy, uh, which is in 6,231 was trained with the cycle GAN, 
but in just uh, with the Prithvi uh, fine tuning, you are using 400 samples only. So overall, you are reducing the number of labeled data. You are reducing the total time spending on pre training, uh, fine tuning of these applications, or also training from scratch, and also you are uh, getting a better performance in terms of uh, having this, uh, fi you know, fine tuning model utilizing this. Right. So before we go with the part two, do we have any questions? And please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to submit any questions or comments, and we'll read them out to Dr. Roboy. In the interest of time, I think we should just keep on going and then. OK. <clears throat> right. So now moving it to the second part, which is the weather FM, uh, so which we have designed. So this is weather FM where we are. Uh, we we are trying to get toward the atmospheric prediction and analysis. So these are the different scales of atmospheric processes that we are looking at. We have the micro, meso, synoptic, global scales. So this is the weather scale that we have here, which is MERA2, ERA5, and HR reset, and the climate lies here. So there's a huge gap here, right? So the challenge for forecasting is atmospheric phenomena occur at many scales. The training data set have limited in scope, and the computational power limits the grid resolution and so to resolve the processes. So the motivation is that in the last two years, we have seen two major revolutions in AI, and that is AI forecast emulators being used in numerical weather predictions, and which is rapid uh, emulation of physical processes traditionally implemented on high-performance computing, right? So we have the foundation model for various data types. We have seen like language, and also we have just done for the Earth observation in the previous one. So which feature already, which is a self-supervised pre-training, so you don't require labels, and the gap-filling problems have been taken care of, as we see in the cloud gap filling, right? So the foundation model for weather and climate, they sit at the intersection, right? But they are heavily underscored in this area. So for example, simulations occur naturally in the weather. Masking and gap filling also occur naturally in the weather. So for example, the downstream task, like you have downscaling, uh, data simulation downscaling can be done easily, right? So the objective is that can we design and train a foundation model for weather that can be easily adapted to multiple use cases? So we, we are looking at the data set here in terms of volume. If you look at it, we have MERA2, which is a three hour temporal resolution with a spatial resolution of 50 kilometer across 60 kilometer. ERA5, which is 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer, and it is from 1940 to 2023. The temporal resolution is also there is in one hour. And HRR, which is, a highly, uh, which is the high resolution data set, it is of three by three kilometer, but it is just available over the US Kona Studio. There are multiple pressure levels and surface variables that we have been considering in this model to design. Then we have the total volume of MERA2 to be 11.2 terabyte plus ERA5 to be 145 terabytes and HRI to be six terabyte. Looking at such huge amount of data, can we design a model that can actually adapt? Can we design a model which will be trained on one data set, can easily adapt to other data sets so that we can save a lot of time on training on individual models on that side, right? So when you look at the distribution function for all of these different variables, for example, MERA2, ERA5, and HRA, three different data sets, right? So we are looking at, uh, for example, in U10, which is the variable for the wind at 10 meter, and then you have the uh, V vector of the wind at the 10 meter, you have temperature at two meter, and then uh, you know mean sea level pressure. So when you look at this, almost you have the traditional similar following patterns, but they are significantly different from each other. When you perform a statistical t-test, you will see that it's higher than uh, it's much higher than 0 0.5, it's like 0 0.7 or something. So it's statistically significant data from each other, and that makes sense as well because these are the reanalysis data set, and they have their own uh, partial differential equations and cost function that have been taken care to come to the same grid, uh, different grid, grid spaces. So in terms of modeling, if you look at the brief history of time, uh, we had initially NWP models, which were in 1958. Then 2019, we started coming up with all the deep learning models. So you have the DLWP, MetNet, MetNet2, ForecastNet, Pangu, GraphWeather, GraphCast, and Climax. Now, when you look at all of these models, so these models were basically focusing on forecasting. These are fundamentally forecasting models. So you're looking at high, lower, you know, lower RMSE, higher uh, ACC, and uh, you know, CSI. The other thing is, in all of these models, there is none of the models are foundation models which can adapt to other you know environment or something other than the only one which 
just Climax, which is the uh, Microsoft uh, foundation model. All of those models are primarily focusing on just forecasting for 14 days uh, ahead and beating the benchmark. This is one of the work that we proposed uh, this year, and this has been accepted to the ICLR 2024 in workshop for AI for differential equation. So where we try to train uh, a model, a uh, unit-based model, where we are using the Clifford algebra onto the shapes where we are taking the U10, V10, and, C, uh, and, and, and SLP in order to see if the model can learn dynamics and solve partial differential equation like shallow water equation. So for this, we just prepared a very small data set. The three variables across seven, uh, you know, seven months of a uh, period of time. And then we predicted over the next one month by providing the initial condition as T is zero. So what does Clifford algebra actually here is me, means is that we are trying to go into the complex domain of uh, Fourier transform. When we do the Fourier transforms, uh, so this was when you look at the previous uh, neural operators uh, papers that has come out. So you're taking initial edge state, you try to see how a specific pixel is evolving in time. And then you try to learn that and apply to the different time domains. So for example, let's say that a specific pixel X comma Y is evolving from zero to 10 time steps. You learn that mapping and you try to apply that to see the same pixel X comma Y can be evolved over 11 to 40 time steps. Now, by doing this in this process, when you learn the partial differential equation or try to learn the approximation of partial differential equation just from the data itself and not encoding this information into the model, you're able to make the model resolution invariant. So in this case, when we are doing the Clifford algebra, we had, we did the, uh, what we are doing is we pass in the uh, data set and then we do an uh, up convolution and then you try to, to calculate the Fourier transform. Then you try to create a, firstly, uh, you define two basis vectors, E1, uh, E2, and then you have the multi-vector E1, E2. In this case, for example, U10 and V10 are vectors, and SLP is a scalar. But uh, this pressure can influence the U and V, and similarly, U and, and vice versa, right? So we take the two input multi-vector and create a dual function. So you have F and F prime, which is given by this function, which is spinors and the vectors. So what you do is you calculate the fast Fourier transform over both of them. You do not ignore the complex part. And then you select the modes that you want to keep and then you revert it back to the predictive state. So you perform Clifford for a transform on each part and revert back and concatenate both of them. So this is what you're looking at is the results. For example, for U500 uh, prediction, target and prediction and the difference. So we are looking at, for example, given a timestamp T0, T1 and T2. Uh, so time zero, what is the uh, target? What was the prediction and what was the difference? So we're looking at the overall difference in terms of this is as zero and it is continuously evolving in time. So we are predicting ahead, ahead, ahead. So the key takeaway that we saw from the model was that the model is able to learn the dynamics related to the geometry. It can be used to train the model and make it resolution invariant by mapping uh, UX to the A, uh, A prime VX. The model computation will grow as we need to perform FFT on the vector and the spinner part, it is double the computation. But the implementation with the transformer can help in efficient mix, uh, you know, mixing tokens and also learning it faster. When we look at the Clifford unit weather prediction, which is a uh, sim similar approach, but here we are looking at when you take the U10 and we try to predict from zero to 60 time steps ahead. After 60 time steps, we are seeing a blow uh, up in the error, right? So it is sort of telling that the model is unstable here, uh, getting unstable here for forecasting after 60 time steps. So you're looking at 60 time steps is somewhere equivalent to, uh, you're looking at five, six, approximately seven days ahead, right? So, you are, so when you're doing this, the issues can be related to the uh, how we are arranging the variables. And, uh, and additionally, we are just taking three variables right now, right? So if we add more variables, which can influence these, uh, you know, these variables and this vector space, we will be able to make the model more stable uh, for the further rollout as well. We also try to look at from the model versus physics point of view. So we try to look at the constant sea level pressure indicating that the mass is conserved. If you look at here, this was calculated from Mera 2. This is the dotted black line. And these are all the different uh, simulations that occurred uh, for the same scenario. Similarly here, when we try to do this with a forecast net uh, in terms of doing the rollout and prediction, we saw that with the slope line, it is decreasing over time, right? So the mass is lost. So the, uh, we, tried, we are trying to fight over that, you know, if the model can actually learn physics and understand very basic principles like conservation of mass or not. So this is the architecture that we have uh, designed. So it is a very, uh, 
abstract form of architecture that I'm showing you guys. Uh, uh, we will be releasing our model and paper soon, so it will be more detail there, but we are taking, we have surface data, we have vertical data, surface climate, vertical climate, statics, uh, statics input and contextual information. So you have the dynamic inputs, uh, and also uh, you perform the tokenization, you do the masking, same approaches that we have discussed before. So you perform the masking and then you have the mask tokens, you do try to predict those masks and minimize over those. So in this case, we took approximately 152 variables. Uh, so the key features of these models, are, this model is that it is a grid-free model. So you can use it for both Euclidean and spherical topologies. Encoder and decoder are fully attention-based. Any uh, so all of the auxiliary information that is example lead time is uh, injected by the context tokens. For example, I want to let's say do a prediction of sixty time steps ahead. I can just give that as a lead time of sixty, and I will be able to get the prediction. Tokenization and output projections are, can use convolutions. There are no hard coded token or window sizes. So this is important because in this case, for example, when we looked at SWIN or VIT, we had the hard coded token and window sizes specified in that. So the input data is time-dependent inputs, and we are using two input time steps. They are vertical and temporal parameter dimensions, and they're all stacked together. And the pretext context is, let's say for mass pre-training and forecasting, we are doing to go ahead for plus three or plus six hours ahead into the future. And let's say having 20% masking or 40% masking in the present. So we are asking the model to go ahead forward as well in the backward directions. So these are the, some of the results that are sort of a sneak peek into the results that we have trained on. So the model has been trained for 300 million parameters. So 200 million are the encoder parameters, 100 million is for the decoder. So we have used a calamity-based uh, mixed loss function here. We trained it for 10,000 steps uh, with the batch size of 16 uh, and it was trained for one a day. So these are a couple of experimentation results. So the model was trained with 20% masking on the T0. And we asked the model to predict plus minus uh, three and plus minus six. So for example, for T2M, if you look at it, the model for the three hours ahead, uh, T2, and this is the absolute error. Similarly here, another experimentation that we did, it was for uh, H68, similar uh, experimentation. We tried to go ahead three hours ahead and three hours, uh, you know, uh, three hours ahead for the target. And this is the output of the model. We tried to look at an absolute error. So it's since the model has been not long trained enough, just for 24 hours, with just 10,000 steps. We're looking at uh, the absolute error where the model is trying to learn these uh, points where you have the mask areas, but ultimately you, you do not have a huge uh, exploding errors that we see in the models. This is another experimentation that we did, which is let's say that we do a masking for 99%. So you remove 99% of the data, only 1% of the data is available. At that time we did a T68, and do a, try to do, do a reconstruction. Now this study can be very useful in doing a, a, you know, a simulation processes and other stuff. So we, the model tried to learn and the squared error, if you look at it from the target and, and the output is absolutely, it, it's, it's very fascinating that the model was able to learn that. For the downstream task, we are looking at, uh, for, the, for these foundation model, we are looking at non-local gravity wave parameterization. So you, in order to actually test the model can learn physics or like approximate these partial differential equation. So you're fine tuning the foundation model to predict the gravity wave momentum flux from the coarse grade atmospheric variables. The data set that we are using is era five, which is for the years 2010, 2012, 2014, 2015. Uh, input are UV and potential temperature. The output is gravity wave momentum fluxes generating using IFS one kilometer. The underlying physics that we are looking at is dynamics where the temporal scale is of for a day spatial scale is mesoscale and the functional application is model parameterization here you are able to look at uh, the baseline that we have created using the uh, you know ann uh, with uh, one by one inputs in instances the another one that we are looking at is uh, aviation turbulence prediction this is a hard task because you are just looking over the uh, corners region and you're looking through the meta 2 data set which is of the 50 kilometer by 60 kilometer of resolution. So it has been prepared using PIREPS and MERA2. So input are TUV, omega, RH, geopotential height, topography, and pressure at 18 UTC. And then output labels are binary classification for turbulence in the next 24 hours. In this case, uh, you're looking at underlying physics, which is dynamics and radiation. But the temporal scale is up to seconds. Turbulence happens per second, but it can persist up to hours. So these are spatial scales or micro scale, and the functional application is detection. 
So these are the baseline AN and classifier accuracy that we have got from the creating a baseline of the model. This is weather analog search. So what do I mean by that is I give you a state of the atmosphere. And now can you go ahead and search me all the state of the atmosphere that have existed, which is similar to this. So this is your query image. And these are your similarity rank once, rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five. So what you're doing is you're providing Mera2, let's say this was a simple experimentation that was done for Mera2 temperature, sea level pressure and wind. And then you are trying to find all the processes. So underlying physics, obviously you're trying to find all the processes that is happening in the, uh, in the atmosphere and trying to find the similarity between all of them. The temporal scale is of ours. The spatial scale is meso to synoptic and the functional application is atmospheric state identification. Another interesting application that we are trying to look at it is from the front of the multi-model. So this is a vision model. Can I combine this with the text in order to get a natural language forecasting? We, uh, we know that we, everybody has seen these uh, new AI models for, uh, you know, who are acting as the weather reporters, right? So to give the text, uh, they're getting reported in the form of the speech for those, uh, you know, in uh, uh, TTS systems, right? So here the goal is to generate a natural language forecast from weather model data. So our input are MERA2, which is over the corners. The what we try, and it is based on the severe weather prediction centers for nat national forecast discussions. Underlying physics, obviously, you're looking at all of the processes, and temporal scale is daily. Uh, spatial scale is synoptic, and the functional application is atmospheric state identification and description, right? So for example, here you provided uh, an input state of the model, and they're giving a generated, uh, so this is the generated forecast from the model itself, and this is the original that was provided to the model. So overall, if you look at it, without even encoding the, uh, you know, space here, we are able to get uh, maybe the regions as well, which is like the Southern Plains and Ohio Valley. Similarly, in this case as well, you are able to get the severe storms, severe thunderstorms from the model, and uh, which is uh, matching somewhere uh, very close to the original pretext that we had. Another task that we are looking at is the long-term precipitation forecasting. Uh, this is one of the major forecasting tasks that we are looking at. So we are trying to look at the global precipitation distribution several weeks into the future. So we have uh, combined visible infrared and microwave observation from geostationary satellites. And the precipitation labels are rain, gauze, corrected estimates of global precipitation. We are trying to look at underlying physics of dynamics, microphysical process, convecting uh, radiation and boundary layer. So the spatial scale is meso to synoptic and temporal scale is sub-seasonal. And the functional application that we are looking at is prediction. Here, if you look at it, this is the baseline that we created with the ResNet architecture for an AI for four week forecast. Hurricane track and intensity prediction is another thing that we are looking at. So predicting the hurricane track and intensity using the uh, foundation model perspective. So we, this result that we are showing is forecast net, and this is fine-tuned using more Mera2 atmospheric variables, including temperature, pressure, and wind as an input. So the in, uh, underlying physics that we're looking at is dynamics, microphysical processes, convective radiation, boundary layer, and stuff. Temporal scale is obviously of weeks, depending on the type of hurricane. And the spatial scale is mesoscale, and the functional application that we're looking at is predictions. So here, if you look at it, the RMSE uh, for the prediction for multiple couple of days ahead from the ground truth to the predicted state, and this is the difference that we're looking at. So in the difference, the model is unable to capture the intensity well enough, but the model is still able to get you know, track errors off, sort of. A couple of outreach things that we have done is we have recently sent our paper to ICLR 2024, as well as the DMLR. Uh, in the, in, one is in AI 4 d uh, AI for PD workshop. Additionally, one is in the data centric machine learning. Additionally, we published uh, our scope paper onto the AI foundation model for uh, weather and climate application and design implementation last year. And then uh, the collaboration between NASA, ORNL, uh, NVIDIA, IBM research was uh, done over the NASA, uh, NASA website as well. These are a couple of references that I've considered uh, for creating the papers. This is the overall team that you're looking at in terms of uh, having the foundation model for weather and FM and multiple overlaps with the GFM as well. So, acknowledgements to University of Alabama, NASA Impact, NASA, IBM, Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory and NVIDIA for all the supported works. Thank you. I'm open for any questions that you guys have. We do have a few in the chat already rolled over from our first Q&A session. Um, the first question might need a little bit of context um, just because it's asking 
what and how did you mask in the first step? And I think this is referring to um, part one. So we might need a little more context on that. So masking in the first step, I understand the question correctly. So how are we masking? So it is just a temporal and spatial masking that we are doing into the model. So let's say that you have, uh, for an example, let's say that you have an input image of 224 by 224 in this space. And then let's say you have three input time steps as well. So you perform a random masking of, uh, you know, spatial as well as temporal, or you can just do spatial of let's say 16 by 16. So you select a patch of 16 by 16, you mask that. So let's say you're masking for 75%. So you will select 16 by 16 patches and mask 75% of them. And you will ask the model to generate those 75% of mask and you will minimize the loss over that. I hope that answers. Okay, another question we have in the chat. Uh, does the foundation model only use HLS data? If yes, then how can we identify different species of crops as shown as one of the application or outputs for foundation models? Or is foundation model able to be used for any satellite image irrespective of spectral and spatial resolution? Okay, no, the current foundation model that we designed is uh, specifically for HLS data. We are still in the, we are in the process of designing another foundation model uh, where we can do multiple resolution as well as we can look at multiple uh, downstreams of the data. Uh, sorry, multiple uh, spatial resolutions as well uh, and temporal that can be uh, used for the downstream. But for now, it was done on the HLS. Uh, so if we if you, if if you can provide the model with the Landsat uh, or Sentinel, uh, let's say RGB and IR surveillance with two, the model should be able to do just fine. But we will be having uh, another release of the model, which will be on the global scale of the data, since this was just on the US CONUS region. So we will be having uh, that in coming, let's say, June or July, where we will be having the model on the global. And also, we'll try to scope out the multiple uh, resolutions of the satellite as well. OK, and I see questions in the chat as well. Um, so I'm just going to bounce over there and then back to the Q&A. So how can we apply foundation models for rare events uh, with a return when the return frequency is very low? Is it solely based on patterns of clouds or moisture changes? And then what are the challenges? That's a that very arise? good question, actually. So uh, one thing that we looked at, so once you try to train a machine learning model from scratch, right, you require a lot of uh, label data. And this is a repetitive statement that we have been hearing from a long time, right? For deep learning, you require a large amount of data. For deep learning, you require a large amount of data. But the question is that do we actually require that much amount of data uh, for fine tuning? So when we looked at the fine tuning uh, of these of this model, we looked at we are looking we are just using let's say twenty five percent actual data that was required, thirty percent actual data that was required. So even uh, the uh, when, when these events are low in nature, you are able to capture that with lesser amount of data by telling the model that hey, these are the events, these are the labels, and this is uh, supposed to be fine tuned, and this is the generation that you're happening. So for example, let's say the hurricane, which are the strong events, but they are happening at a long, you know, multiple scales, but they, were, they are not that rare in nature, but they are still rare in terms of frequency and intensity because this sort of act as an anomaly, but the model is able to learn that as well. And then we have a couple questions again in the Q&A. So what are the applications of the weather analog search? So for the weather analog search, we are trying to uh, look from the current state that if, the, if we can retrieve, given an atmospheric state of the uh, of the uh, atmospheric state as an initial condition, can I get all other different conditions of atmospheric that have happened? Now that can lead to multiple research uh, directions that one can take. Uh, Again, I'm not an atmospheric scientist to comment on that. But for example, you can uh, you can identify for for hurricane. Let's say you provided hurricane five days uh, before the hurricane started. You provided that initial condition and asked the model to find all the atmospheric state for that. Now you try you can conduct the research on seeing that are they common uh, for you know events for understanding the hurricane relationship to all the pressure levels and variables, or there are some changes. Okay, 
we have a flood of questions coming in, so I'm going to try and get to as many as we can while being time sensitive. Um, another question, did I understand the merit to time step is around three hours? How does this compare the spatial resolution following the conventional CFL criteria used in NWP? Okay, I somehow don't understand this question very clearly, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, take it like, yes, Mera 2 uh, is three hours that we are trying to train on. Uh, and we are trying to train the model on that. And then we are going to transfer. So we are doing the downscaling on the model for let's say ERA 5 or HRR for a final resolution or any other resolution of the model that you will try to go ahead, go ahead with. But you will be doing a downscaling right now. We are trying to do a downscaling in spatial uh, domain itself only. So if the model is once pre-trained on Mera 2, you can downscale it to let's say 50 kilometer to 55 kilometer and also lower scale as well. I think Johannes has something to say. Yeah, yeah, just to add, I think, just to add, I think actually the question Suja came out up and some of our colleagues know so far, I think um, we haven't really looked into like CFL criteria, okay, uh, the reason being actually twofold, none, as Suja said, and maybe this is something we need to do in the future, you know, but reason one being we just basically sit on the same, you know, resolution and time step as the actual Mera 2 reanalysis, you know, which also had like certainty in non-American processes, which do work well. And that sort of, sort of also, I think, somewhat the general practice right now on the AI emulator side. No, but since the question does come up repeatedly, you're not the first person to ask this. I think um, we might have to look at this in the future. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Johannes and Sujit. Um, let's see. Okay, um, the Prithvi model has been trained on HLS data in a flood mapping case. Sentinel-1 data is used along with Sentinel-2. Can you explain how the foundation model behaves with respect to other sensor data, such as Sentinel-1, on which it hasn't been already pre-trained on? That's a good question. Uh, no, we have not tested uh, right now uh, with how does it behave on other sensors data. Primarily, because we feed, sorry, we feed the model with the uh, these uh, specific sensors only, which is RGB and IR and so sensor two and which from the HLS data set. So we have tested on that as well. We have not looked at the cross-domain transfer in terms of the uh, different sensor data. Okay, and I'm gonna pull just a couple of other questions out and then of course I can share um, Dr. Roy um, and Dr. Johanna Schmidt's uh, email addresses for additional questions and comments, but um, what pre-processing techniques are employed to clean and standardize data for modeling? So that's a very key question. I'm like, depending on which model you're training, this would change, right? So for example, when you're doing an HLS-based, uh, 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 you know, fine-tuning business, because I can consider Earth is static as a whole. So not a lot of the information that is changing is comparatively much lesser than the information that is not changing. So you will require a pre-process steps to select the data, which is not more inclined and biased towards uh, the spatial information that is over repetitive in nature. So that's why we use the clustering approach of uh, you know temperature and precipitation and perform the cluster based on that so that there is a, not a biasness in terms of the local uh, information that is in the model. Similarly, you can use other aspects as well in pre-processing to select the variety of data the model need to uh, see in order to predict you know, better. In the weather FM, we just train on full Mera 2. Obviously, you try to look at the statistics and also the uh, calculate the scaling parameters for the model. You want to look at the mean and standard deviations. And also, how do you want to do it? Uh, do you want to do the mean and standard deviations across the, all the whole data set? Or you want to do it channel-wise or dimensions-wise in terms of like band-wise? So this is a couple of things that you can look at apart from the standard procedures of having mixing data, uh, you know, outliers detection and other stuff. All right, and I know we're coming up on time now and there's still lots of questions flooding in, really great questions. Um, so I think our next steps are to share contact information. Um, so hold on to your questions, they're fantastic. Um, but unfortunately we've reached time for today. So, um, oh, well, I guess we can take a few more questions. <laughs> we'll do maybe one or two more questions, um, time permitting. So I'm just gonna pull a random one from the chat just momentarily. Um, how do you define the threshold of where the training data is enough to name a model foundational when it is trained, since uh, you can temporarily and spatially extend the data? 
sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't get the question. Is it in Q and A or? This one's in the chat. So how do you define the threshold of where training data is enough to name a model foundational? Oh, okay. Since you can tempor oh. temporarily and spatially extend the data. I see. Okay. So that is, okay. That is a very existential question that has been raised. So no data is enough. And uh, in this case of fine tuning, we are trying to say that less data is enough in order to fine tune the model for that. But uh, what we are trying to aim is, especially designing all these models, is we are to, trying to capture as many different processes that is happening or as many different uh, changes that is happening over time. So for that, we would like to get as much data as possible, which are which, which can capture different processes and different uh, evolutions uh, that is happening related to the Earth in time to capture those things. So there is not, not a very straightforward answer that I have, which is that this much amount of X amount of data should be sufficient or any ballpark figure as well. But uh, it is more onto the amount of uh, processes that you want to ca capture and what you want your foundation model to do. In order to call it foundational, any model is not going to do all the downstream tasks with beating all the benchmarks until unless you have a huge training done in terms of uh, all of the looking at all the spatial and temporal changes that has encompassed it. And then finally, um, what are the challenges to design a foundational model for a multimodal data? Hmm. Designing a multi-model data, if multi-model means the different sensors here, then you are looking at obviously trying to, one is harmonization, obviously, when you're looking at it from the Prithvi perspective, you're looking at the harmonization possibilities that can my red be equal into the red in some other, uh, you know, uh, satellite. Second, second thing is spatial resolution. So obviously you're looking at somebody, uh, you are looking at, let's say in Landsat, you have 30 meter, in Sentinel, you have 10 meter. In other uh, planet data set, let's say you have three meters and in Maxar you have one meter, right? So all of these are spatially changing. So they are capturing different informations. So when you are going from upward, it is technically much easier because you're trying to not construct any pixels. But uh, when you're doing downward, you're trying to construct the fixed pixels. In that case, you have to perform a science-based validation as well, whatever you're calculating and you know doing is meaningful. So these are a couple of things that is, uh, you know, are the edge cases that we need to consider. Second thing is obviously the temporal resolution. For example, let's say if I take an example of planet data set, which is daily in nature, but it is just calculated over the uh, land, not over the ocean. Then you have the uh, uh, lens, uh, HLS, which is uh, two days approximately, two and a half days. So you are having a huge gap time there. So how do you want to select the data so that you are going to take the temporally coherent as well as the spatial? And it is meaningful in nature as well so that you're not overfitting the model on the changes that are not consistent and you're able to capture, let's say, long-term sequences in terms of LULC or something else. Jake, are we done with questions? We still have plenty in the chat, but I don't think we have enough time to answer them. So yeah, this has been a very engaging discussion. Uh, thank you, Sujit and Johannes, for putting this together. And uh, I think since the, there's going to be a new working group, I think we should just use that as a channel to answer any questions, future events, updates, and so on. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody who's stuck around for more than an hour. I see the number of attendances uh, going down now because I think it's hard to put together an hour and a half. So hour is probably the right time to uh, conclude this. And uh, thank you, Jarek, especially for coordinating this. And thank you, Haley, if you're still around. Uh, what we will do in uh, coming weeks is uh, put this recording into the YouTube channel of the IEEE. And we'll announce that over the email since we have the, the webinar info. Yeah, when it's made available. And Jerica had shared or will share the slides to all the participants uh, and all the links related to any development of the foundation model is available there, including the uh, repositories and uh, the training information. So with that, thanks everyone again. And hopefully you will uh, join us in future uh, working group webinars and events. Thank you all. Bye-bye.
Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye.